It's 2050, everyone. We made it. <laughs> it's been 20 years since the taps ran dry. Industry pretty much shut down. The dams dried up and people took matters into their own hands. There were water wars on the streets with people fighting each other for this precious resource. But then, amazingly, things did get better. It was Bayard Rustin who said, we are one, and if we don't know it, we will find out the hard way. We moved from fear and desperation to a culture based on peer-to-peer, -peer, conscious collaboration, cooperation, care and concern, and the mutual understanding of the interconnectedness of life. We really learned how to value everything and everyone. Whether you were a street cleaner or a doctor, everybody felt seen and recognized and realized their part in the whole and how critical they were. I believe we evolved as a species to be able to prioritize the whole and trust and know that we as individuals would be looked after. It's 2050, everyone. It's been 20 years since the taps ran dry. I have this morning's newspaper with me that I picked up. Let's have a look. There's some good news in it for a change. The front cover. We've heard a lot of it today. How the crisis brought us together. First article. We grasped that just how the Earth is not at the center of the universe, so humans are not at the center of the Earth. Yes, it's true. We are not the most important species on this planet. We finally quieted our cleverness and dropped that arrogant thinking that made us believe that we were separate from and therefore had dominion over nature. And we finally grasped that by abusing nature, we were actually abusing ourselves. So it's not about you, and yet it's all about you and me. Page two, power becomes decentralized. We've also heard it quite a bit today. The central governments fell and power became decentralized with neighborhoods becoming autonomous, operating like small tribes. Leaders simply became facilitators with no real power, trained in social technologies like deep democracy and theory you and servant leadership. We created safe spaces to have those very, very difficult conversations to ensure that all the voices in the room were heard. That really did help quell the violence that ravaged our cities for so long. Politics died when the taps ran dry, and we realized that power lay within ourselves and our community networks. We traveled to our neighbors, to Lesotho, to Botswana, and to Namibia to learn how to be resilient. We also recognized the value of simplicity and low-tech solutions, and the need to preserve water for future generations. It's 2050, everyone. It's been 20 years since the taps ran dry. Next title, Water is Alive. I love this one. It belongs to no one and now has the same rights as human beings with legal consequences for anyone who seeks to damage it or misuse it. The Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature were happy and so was Cormac Cullinan. Water is now not permitted to be used in the making of anything that harms the body or the environment. So I guess that shut down the arms trade pretty fast. All power is renewable. Our last speaker said it beautifully. Generated from the sun, from wind, from algae, and from ambient human movement. Neighborhoods, workers, microgrid systems, sharing power, resources, and water. Our utilities are owned and managed by those people in the neighborhoods. And we became micro-ambitious and killed the big ideas. We also saw how destructive 5G was, so we designed a wave pattern like Tri-Vortex that enhanced life every time we picked up the phone. Neighborhoods now harvest runoff water together as it comes off the mountains and the roofs, storing it in tanks 
and in cisterns under parks and the schools and under homes. Where boreholes were once illegally controlled by individuals, now they are shared by clusters of households. And the Meza to Meza initiative, neighbor to neighbor, which was designed in Langrich informal settlement in the Western Cape, has gone national. It really is through a sense of belonging by sharing tasks, responsibilities, and resources. Biomimicry, the practice of learning from and emulating the genius of nature to solve human challenges, has become the foundation of design of all form, all processes, and all systems. We really have had a systems change. For example, we learned how to regulate temperature in our buildings by studying termite mounds. Mick Pierce would be proud. There was no more air conditioning. Our cities act like forests and are filled with trees to reduce evaporation. Every building acts like a tree, scrubbing the air, making oxygen, generating soil and nutrients. Sia Sokoma's running with that tree on his back did more than he could possibly imagine. It's 2050, everyone. It's been 20 years since the taps ran dry. And look at what we've done together. Compost toilets, interesting. After sewage systems broke down, we had to turn all gardens into many wetlands to clean the runoff. Every home built a compost toilet. And since nature does not know waste, everything produced has a function and purpose, we turned the humanure generated into energy. We had BEE, but now we have PEE. <laughs> Poop economic empowerment. <laughs> with power truly being produced by the people. <laughs> Even the nutrients from our urine is harvested in order to create fertilizer for earthbound agriculture, and every house has a biodigester. Food gardens and food forests are commonplace, with individuals growing their own microgreens and fermenting vegetables and sprouts. And did you know the most highly paid people in the world are now those who teach us how to grow food, and it's not GMO, and it is organic. To address, however, the enormous poverty crisis, we had to move to the ocean. Yes, aquabotanicals led the food revolution. It says here that the majority of food is now cultivated in the ocean in vertical farms, with seaweed having become the new staple. We stopped overfishing, we cleaned up the ocean, and we restored it to a natural state, balancing out that oxygen level. John Todd really did leave a legacy, with every boat having an ocean restorer attached to it, cleaning as it moved. Restoration became the savior. Maize, wheat, and meat no longer feature on the plate. The penny finally dropped that it took thousands of liters to make one kilogram of beef. Of course, that's not to say the same for the farmer Angus earlier today. It'd be very different. So now we eat kelp steak and seaweed pasta, and all packaging is biodegradable, made from hemp and cassava and fungi, mycelium, seaweed, and bamboo. And yes, hemp has replaced cotton as the dominant crop and led us in the whole natural medicine industry. Hmm. Ownership became an archaic idea. It's true. Land reformation did happen, thanks to the man of the soil, with those who were receiving the land being mandated to become custodians and held accountable by their peers that if land degraded, they would be removed. We were inspired by the work of Dr. John Liu and went camping, initiating thousands of eco-restoration camps, helping to restore degraded landscapes. And that tiny little succulent plant, known as the speckworm, became the hero of our time, sequestering four to five tons of carbon per hectare. It's 2050, ladies and gentlemen. Look what we've done together. The nature of our education has changed, with forest schools, green schools, and earth schools emerging as the main form of study. We were taught how to grow food, how to relate, and how to accept ourselves and respect everyone equally. The principles of Ubuntu became entrenched in our early childhood development and education. And every child values the absolute balance 
between the principles of the masculine and the feminine, and the time of the overriding of the masculine had come to an end. We made money from cleaning up, believe it. We created a truly inclusive and circular economy based on ecological function and well-being, as opposed to production of stuff that we didn't really need. We then progressed to a new sharing economy, and we stopped trying to monetize everything. We saw that the creation, the issue, and control of money by a central body was indeed a problem. So we moved to cooperative banks, owned again and managed by the local communities. We used electronic means, yes, to record transactions, and it then became clear that there was no need for a circulating currency. So we adopted a multitude of methods of exchange. One to one, one to many, many to one, many to many, and community to community. The community exchange system became core to our economic activity to ensure that no one body took control of the means of exchange, since that is the basis of an unequal society. We finally asked, what can we give rather than what we can get? So maybe the crisis and running out of water wasn't that bad. The final page says, how did these big shifts happen? It's written by the editor, and I think our previous speaker could have been him. <laughs> Firstly, we recognized that the pollution was not only out there, but it was also in here. And we realized that if we want outer change, we have to be ready to change inside, ready to change our viewpoints, our beliefs, and our attitudes. We finally began to experience within ourselves, on a scale, the breakup of the egoic mind patterns and a new dimension of consciousness. And how did we do this? It's so simple. We learned to listen. We listened to nature and realized that if we do not abide by the rules of nature, we would not survive. We listened to the indigenous people of the earth who are holding ancient and sacred wisdom of how to live on this planet healthily and responsibly. We participated in various ancient rituals like trance dances, sweat lodges, medicine ceremonies to help us connect more deeply to the earth. And of course, we listened to each other. And we recognized that it is in fact our differences that make us the same. And truly embraced the concept of unity and diversity as is enshrined in the South African coat of arms. And we finally created safety for women. And we listened to mothers and of course to the children. Greta Thunberg made sure of that. On the way to Johannesburg, when I was leaving Cape Town, my daughter and I had a little time together, and she gave me something that she had written at school, and I felt it's appropriate to read it here. It's addressed to a multinational. <laughs> Dear company, I really like your products, especially your hot chocolate, but I've stopped because I don't want to buy things with palm oil in them. If you really need to use palm oil, Use sustainable palm oil, because orangutans are dying and a lot of other species. Yours sincerely, grade two and three, Mila Cardinal Friedman. We need to listen to our children. And yes, we listen through the machines. An algorithm written by an AI programmed to prioritize life found a way to reduce and change our consumption to one that factored in the limits of our natural environment paving a way to a regenerative future for all life on Earth. And finally, we listened to ourselves, to the voice within, to our intuition, to the Great Spirit, to the Divine, to the Ahmad Lozi. And we created time for practicing mindfulness every day and realized the power of those daily habits and rituals. Stillness. So in this moment, I'd like to invite each of you to uncross your legs, put your hands on your knees, take a moment to close your eyes, and take a deep breath. And imagine 
It's 2050. What is the world that you want to live in in 2050? And the next deep breath. What is the action? 